Good to see such a large turnout, 85 people registered. So I'm pretty excited about it. I think we annual talk about the Spinnaker Summit coming up uh, in Seattle in September. Um, so thank you for that. Today we have two great session, two great presentations. Um, Matt and uh, Michael is going to go through the Kayanta, which is the automated calendar analysis open source tool that Netflix and Google has been working on, and I think this is great um, to validate your releases. And next, we have customers who are asking about OpenShift support for Flickr. Um, technically, you know, the, the OpenShift was not is not is not a cloud provider, but you can use the Kubernetes-based uh, cloud provider to connect to OpenShift. And Gopinath from OpsMX will go through that. And uh, with that, without further ado, we're uh, done. Thank you, Balaji. Thanks for everyone showing up. Just as a friendly reminder, I think taxes are due tomorrow, and Danny from Intuit is happy to help you with your taxes. <laughs> so I did want to just quit, uh, do a quick blurb. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the Spinnaker community, last year we had a Spinnaker Summit here at Netflix, and we are holding another Spinnaker Summit. And it is actually in October, I believe October 8th and 9th. <clears throat> It'll be announced next week. It's going to be in Seattle, and we'd love to see all of you there. Uh, the, the call for papers uh, will open up sometime next week. So just keep your eye out in the you know, Spinnaker Slack, Spinnaker community. We'll make an announcement, but it's a, it's a professional thing. It's not put out by me anymore. I actually hired someone to do this, so it's going to be a great conference. <laughs> and it's going to be open to all. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to the the good folks who made uh, ACA a reality for everyone. Hello, my name is Michael and I'm from Netflix. This is Matt from Google. And we are here to talk about Kayenta for automated canary analysis. Yay. So one thing we missed in the previous talk was what Kayenta actually was. We thought we should start out a little differently this time and tell you that. Uh, Kayenta is the next generation canary analysis platform that was developed jointly with Netflix and Google. It's using a lot of the Netflix uh, learned history on how to do canaries. Uh, it was initially focused, it is initially focused on automated canary analysis, but the platform itself is actually being it planned to be used for other things as well. Uh, one example of this is we, we do something here called chaos engineering where you inject a deliberate failure in an application and then verify that you saw the failure and that the application otherwise behaves correctly. So it's a good way to test a case. In that case, you want to see a metric fail, but you want to see a different metric pass. And we integrated very closely within Spinnaker. Uh, most of our users here at Netflix do use Spinnaker for Canary work. Some still use the API, which is still supported as well. And more importantly, we have open source Kayenta now. It is open sourced as of last Tuesday, which is pretty nice for us. The goals uh, from the entire start were to improve on the system that we've had here at Netflix for many years. And that system really suffered from a lot of issues that we've addressed, and, and they were first class things we had to fix. And you'll see that slide later. Pretty much everything on that slide that are the goals are exactly the problems we had with the system. Uh, one thing, once again, we integrated fully within Spinnaker, so the configuration is entirely within Spinnaker as opposed to a separate UI that we used to have. We have canary stages that uh, right now do not spin up infrastructure, but later will. And the reports themselves are all within Spinnaker. So everybody who uses Spinnaker sees everything all the way through um, from a, it feels very natural from a Spinnaker standpoint. And by open sourcing this, we plan on building a good community. Right now, we wrote a lot of the stuff for uh, Atlas, which is used primarily at Netflix. There's also Stackdriver support, and there's Prometheus support, which is written by Google. We also have uh, Datadog written as a, as a contribution, which is the first success of this. And once again, the technical goals, scalability, maintainability, extensibility, all the problems we have with the old system uh, that we try to address. And uh, we are very happy that whenever I, look at a, whenever I look at a graph of the new system versus the old system, it looks like something I want to manage. Uh, the code is well tested. It's designed from the very ground floor to be uh, unit tested all the way through. Um, everything is archived. So when you fetch the metrics from something, we archive those metrics so we can go back and, and replay 
a different algorithm or maybe different settings on the same data. Um, and this really has improved our, our cycle to go back through. Where, uh, if we, when we change the algorithm, we can go back through and verify that it behaves at least as well, or at least an expected difference there. Uh, the old system was very clunky to do that with. So I'd like to uh, make sure we're all talking about what canary analysis is and isn't. And we view this as a release process where any change, it typically code changes, but it can be any kind of change, including property changes or configuration changes or other types of changes that affect the production system. You roll that change out slowly, and then you measure the results to see if the new system is behaving at least as well as the old system to make certain it's safe to continue the deployment. And the Spinnaker pipeline, the Spinnaker stages along the way have a way to either manually approve or to automatically approve, depending upon the score, uh, what, what to do next. Typically, we do use code deployment here, but we also do fast property changes, which are uh, affect a huge number of servers all at once. So you can roll that server change out, and pretty much any operational change. The one thing canaries aren't is a form of unit testing. The idea is that you're deploying something that you would otherwise put in production if you didn't have a canary analysis stage in there. So this isn't something like, oh, I'm going to throw this out and see how it works. You've already done all the testing. You expect it to have a certain behavior. This just verifies that that behavior is it's not doing something you didn't expect. And the typical deployment that we use here, and this can vary depending on how it's set up within Spinnaker, uh, is to have the production system is left alone running the old version of code. You would then spin up a bait or Spinnaker would spin up a baseline for you that has at least one new instance of that old code running, and then another instance of the new code. And the reason we spin up that middle baseline one is so that you eliminate a lot of startup effects, because otherwise that old one may be running for weeks or months or days, and you don't know how it's going to compare usefully to the newly spun up canary. And we recommend at least one instance, uh, obviously, but three is a good number that we like to target because we have three availability zones, and it's nice to have something running into those zones for comparison. But uh, the important thing is that some amount of traffic goes to both the baseline and the canary, and you don't end up with uh, you're not you don't want to take a lot of traffic from the production system. You want to get a small percentage of the traffic. So if you only have three production nodes and you spin up three baseline and three canary, you're going to get the majority of the traffic going to your, your 32% of the traffic is going to go to the canary, and that's probably not what you want. Kayenta basically does this over and over again for all sorts of uh, comparisons. It gathers the metrics. It runs the validation on that metric to verify that at least we got something. Cleans up the data a bit. Uh, so the validation part actually also puts the baseline and canary together in the system, so we can easily compare those. Things of the data, this is like uh, NAN removal, so if, you get not, uh, if you're get not, if you missing data, for, in some cases here at Netflix, uh, Atlas doesn't report data for things that don't report, so error metrics are sparse. They can fill those with zeros, for example. Um, then it compares those and it gives you a score at the end. And Matt's going to go over some of the details about what that looks like with the demo. Can I have a question now? Sure. So, in the previous slide, you mentioned this startup effect. And the start, you kind of addressed that uh, in terms of comparing baseline versus canary. But it doesn't really solve the problem in terms of, okay, this new deployment, after you deploy it over time, but then some later latent issue then emerge compared to the production system. How do you address that? Okay, I don't quite understand the question. You're, so the baseline and canary are both spun up at the same time? Right. Okay, and you're but saying... If the startup effect takes, say, three months. Oh, I see. Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying... Sorry, the question is how do you avoid startup effects um, that may take a long time to present? Right. Uh, we don't really expect the canary to find that. Mainly because the startup effect, it, that, that's for alerts, that's other kinds of, of monitoring that would, you know, instance goes bad. But the, the canary that we're trying to do is, is compare from the, from the start time for the baseline to the start time for the canary, how do they behave? So if it really takes a long time to go, you probably don't have a three-month canary running. So 
so we would detect something like that. Right. So there's some limitation in terms of this uh, approach, right? Yes, yes. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't use your production system. Well, there's a warm-up period. You could figure out how many seconds are in three months. <laughs> you really wanted to put that in there, but it feels probably like not a perfect fit for that. Yeah, and there, as Matt mentioned, there is a warm-up period. So if your application takes 40 minutes to load up a cache or something, you can let it run for 40 minutes before we start that first analysis. So that's good. It's probably also worth noting that use cases for Canary, at least in Netflix, we we turn over new instances far more quickly than three months. So again, we wouldn't necessarily attack that. The yeah. application already changed. So yeah. It doesn't matter. Okay. Well, I mean, so a Canary analysis is really a deployment stage. If you really have a three-month deployment, I'm not certain that we can help you with Canaries. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the judgment stage of, of Canary Analysis is we compare every single metric individually and give it a score or a pass, fail, uh, or pass, high, low, or no data. No data means we got no data from the Canary or the baseline and we expect that, or we got no data from both. Like uh, error, error counters are very popular here that we don't get anything because there weren't any errors, which is wonderful, but we still pass that. Uh, high or low are obviously the Canary is higher or lower, so if the, if the latency in the canary is higher, that would be classified as higher, otherwise it's a pass. Anything that isn't a pass is actually a fail unless it's unless we mark it specifically as okay. In some cases, you might be okay if your canary handles more requests per second than your baseline, but in other cases, you really don't expect that, so you don't want that to happen. Uh, we also, in the current scheme, we assign all these metrics to groups, and then each group is individually scored with a weight to find apply the final score. And we're thinking about some changes here to make this simpler and more explainable, but we're not quite certain what that's going to look like yet. We might make groups just a presentation, or pre presentation only scheme and just every metric stands on its own, which encourages people to pick high quality metrics to start with instead of something that has a weak representation and scale it down. And for the details and the demo, I'm going to hand it off to Matt. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so. Can you hear me okay with this mic? Okay, I'm gonna show a, a demo. I wanted to describe a little bit about how Kyant is integrated with Spinnaker before we get to the demo, so, so what we're looking at makes sense. Um, Spinnaker's made up of a bunch of independent services, maybe nine or 10 or 11 or probably 12 by the time we're done here tonight. So Kayenta is another microservice that makes up Spinnaker. It lives in a oh, under Spinnaker's a Spinnaker org on GitHub. Um, the configuration of it, everything else look a lot like other Spinnaker services. It has some dependencies, which are a lot like other Spinnaker services like Redis and storage buckets and things like that. Um, under the covers, as Michael mentioned, we really wanted to make the system like modular and pluggable and not just sort of code one way to do it. And then every time we wanted to make a change, we had to figure out how to like you know, graph that on. So within Kayenta, the different bits of work are orchestrated using Orca. So the workflow engine that's like a prime piece of Spinnaker, we link it in as a library and we use that internally within the Kayenta service to orchestrate the steps. And the steps would be things like um, <coughs> go out in parallel and fetch these hundreds of, of time series from, from different metric stores and then align them and pair them up and then pass it off to the different phases like clean it and deal with anomalies and then do the judgment or the analysis. So all of that is orchestrated internally with a component of Orca, and this lets us you know, add on advanced use cases, make changes, and do, the, do all these things in a, in a disciplined way where we're not kind of breaking the thing into pieces uh, every time we want to make a change. Uh, in addition, we, we identified like the most important plug points from the beginning. So Michael mentioned a bunch of uh, telemetry stores we have built-in support for. Those things are built really as plugins. Um, we did that from the beginning. When we first stood it up, um, there were no services supported, and then we just started adding different metric services. Um, obviously, Michael and the folks at Netflix did Atlas. We did Stackdriver and Prometheus and Armory. And I don't know if I saw any Armory guys here tonight. They did the Datadog integration. It all went pretty smoothly. Um, there are some very well-defined interfaces, and really a bunch of um, entry points for troubleshooting and development and testing and things that, that make it quite easy to add new uh, support for new metric services. Uh, the same for judges. So there's 
judge that comes with it, which is like the sort of battle-tested judge from within Netflix. There are other folks, OpsMX, Google, other folks adding different types of judges over time, and all of that is pluggable. And these things are configurable. When you configure your Canary setup with that Spinnaker, you can choose whatever judge is available and tune it, whatever makes sense. And the last thing, the, the storage services, like the the mechanisms used for persistence, like GCS and S3, there's an in-memory one. All of those things are configurable as well and, and extensible. So uh, Michael mentioned that you know, the prime use case is as part of Spinnaker, but it can be consumed on its own. There are lots of use cases we can think of uh, where this makes sense. <laughs> Kayenta, and this, this isn't immediately obvious when you see it run, but the way Kayenta works is at some point in time, some external entity, which in most cases will be a parent Spinnaker pipeline, says, do this analysis for me now. And the bits it has to give to Kayenta to make that happen, a canary configuration, some scoping information, like these are the things I want you to go find, time boundaries, um, like variable bindings to be used to expand templates and things like that. And as long as you give it all of those things, it'll go off and do its analysis and it does it in real time as you ask it to. So it can be consumed in other settings beyond the, the, the prime use case that we're going to discuss here. And lastly, for folks that have a lot of Spinnaker experience, um, Halyard is like the, the key mechanism for installing and configuring and upgrading Spinnaker uh, out in the wild. Um, and we added full support for Kayenta into Halyard. So with Halyard, you can enable it. You can do the different UI configurations. You can enable and disable all the different metric services and tweak them and point to buckets and all the different things you would expect. You don't have to touch any YAML uh, to stand it up and make it work with your spinnaker. So, and as of so last Tuesday when we released it, we put out a preview spinnaker release called um, Canary Preview, I think. It's on the Spinnaker I.O. page. And 1.7.0 is being worked on right now. Um, the branches have been cut, and Kayanta will be a part of that as well. Okay. All right. Has anybody not seen Spinnaker before? <laughs> New glasses, Rob. All right, so this is Spinnaker. There's really two sides, and I'll do this for a minute, and then we'll we'll get right into it. There's the the like operational pane, the clusters management view, which shows what you have running and health information, and it kind of groups things in a logical way. And then you have really the automation side, which is the pipeline configuration and execution and all of those things. Um, so this is this is a handful of, of clusters. Um, these are GCE server groups. Most folks here, that's a lot like an AWS ASG, but it has a different name and it's a different thing in a different cloud, but they're quite similar. So these are, on GCE, we call these managed instance groups. You know, it's a set of replicas, right? Um, with some configuration and auto scaling capabilities and all of that. So these two server groups here, think of this one as the old version, this one as the new version. We ran this in advance, we'll run it again now, but the idea is we're not just all gonna sit and wait for three months while the canary runs or whatever, we're gonna we'll, we'll try to do it like cooking show style. So we had version one, we rolled out version two. It, there's nothing all that interesting on those VMs. There's three VMs in each, in each group. Um, there's Apache 2 running, so the health checks say, yeah, it's running and um, installed some monitoring stuff. We're using Stackdriver for this setup. So there's an agent installed, and then there's, on version two, there's like, yes, redirected to dev null, so the CPU spikes, basically. Other than that, there's nothing going, nothing really interesting. Okay. Um, but we have a couple of pipelines, which we'll look at in a second, and in the configuration of these pipelines, which we'll go through in detail, we refer to canary configurations. So we have to look at the canary configurations first. Okay. And this is the... This is the sort of complicated part to look at. Um, the way to think about this is um, you would define really a set of templated queries for whatever metric store you're using. So whatever metric store you're publishing to from your infrastructure, your applications, you need to define queries against that, that infrastructure or against the, the metric store with different points where variables would be plugged in and things would be expanded and it would be scoped to your use case. So this is the mechanism to define those, those templates. Um, they're quite similar from system to system. So Stackdriver, Prometheus, Atlas all look fairly similar. You name the different queries. You, as Michael described, you group them together. You assign weights to the different groups to be used in scoring. You decide, yes. Can you increase the font a little bit? So there's definitely some threshold where it's going to become illegible and we have to page Chris Perry. But is that better? Uh, yeah, that's better. I can go one more, but I think we're... 
right. So, like stack drivers, Prometheus, Atlas, Dialog, they look fairly similar. When you really get into the details, where you choose like the one individual metric you want to look up, then they start to look slightly different. And we'll show this now. Um, each service has a, you know, like a command completion. It'll pre-populate a pull down with the actual metrics that are available. So it tries to make it easy. So you're not just like black box trying to make it work. Okay. So. We set up, I mean, there's a bunch of canary configs on the left. We're going to look at two of them now. Um, this is a demo one. It's pointing at stack driver. We created three, um, we referenced three individual metrics within this canary configuration. It's kind of nonsensical, but we chose things that will show big differences so that when we run the actual canary and we get to the graphs, it's legible and you can see it. they're very close. It's hard to read. Um, in any case, so there's a CPU one, a memory one, and something about network connections. But this is an example of what it looks like to configure one of the metric queries within a canary configuration. So we have to put it in a group, we give it a name, and this name is used, you know, in the graphs, it can be used in other spots, but mainly that's, that's like for decorative purposes and for group. So where it gets interesting is this metric type. So this is a pull down. Um, if you start typing, it'll query the backing system. So in this case, these are, you know, stack driver metrics that are available. And they're available within the environment we're pointing at because you can have custom metrics like a system. So you would choose one of those metrics so we can group it and do other things. There's this fail on thing, which is kind of neat. So if what you're looking at is error rate, you can say like a, you know, if it increases, I want you to fail. If you're looking at latency, um, you would say increase, I want you to fail. But if it's something else, you can say, well, if there's any significant change, I consider that a regression and I want you to fail. The idea is to, to really uh, characterize the type of metric and not for each one define a set of rules. Okay, so you do this for a bunch of metrics. Um, you can see they're all named, they're all in groups, and then at the bottom you define weights. Um, I don't want to like beat the UI to death, but the idea is um, when you're done with this canary configuration, you have this templated query, you've defined how it's going to be scored by assigning weights to the different groups of metrics, and you've assigned thresholds which will be used as defaults when you configure your canary stage in a pipeline. And we'll talk about how they're used in a moment, but it's mainly to determine if the canary is good enough to keep going or if it should fail right away. And then all the way at the end, you know, is it a pass or a fail? Okay. Backing all of this, like just about everything else in Spinnaker, you'll see some JSON. Yep, I'll make it bigger. So not wildly interesting, but it is, there's a full format for this. Um, we swaggered everything. So every single thing that you see us doing with this, there's a swagger endpoint with all the annotations. We have proper structs for everything. Um, the idea from the beginning was to make it easy to develop against it. No, but but if you have questions, just email Michael directly. I'll just pour it off. I'll handle all of that for you. All right, so we'll look at a pipeline. It's a very simple pipeline. It has one stage, canary analysis. It's probably not a legitimate representation of a production pipeline. But I think the most important thing in this configuration is at the top where you say real time or retrospective. So the idea with real time, if you use that, it's going to start waiting and it's going to wait for whatever amount of time you tell it to wait. It'll figure out all the warm-ups and intervals and all that stuff, but it's going to wait. So if we did a one-hour canary now, which would probably be a pretty short canary anyway, we have to just sit here and make conversation for an hour. So you can do retrospective. All the parameters are the same, except instead of starting to wait at the point it begins to execute, you give it time boundaries. And this is a key use case we wanted to support both with UI integration, but the backend system specifically is that we want to give you all the information. We want to be able to rerun the analyses. We want to be able to do different kinds of slicing and dicing later so we can improve the canaries, not run everything from scratch all the time. Wait. So in many cases, you can do retrospective analysis against things that may not even exist anymore, as long as you still have the time series data or the intermediate objects that Kayent is persisting in each step. Okay. So let's look at the parameters pretty quickly and then we'll run it. So we choose a config name. That screen we were just looking at, everything you edit there gets a name. Um, and anywhere you refer to it, it'll be by name. So they're like the unique IDs, the, the UIDs underneath, you never have to interact with. Um, there's an interval here and it's not immediately obvious what this is. Um, you either set a duration for the, the overall canary analysis or you give it a start and a, and a stop time. But in either case, you're specifying some duration of time, whether you're explicit or you say start now and wait this long. The interval says how to break up that 
that overall duration. So if you give a duration of one hour and you say 15 minute intervals, it's gonna do four individual canary analysis runs. So if you're doing retrospective, it'll do them all one after the next or in parallel. If you're doing a real time, it's going to do the 15 minutes. You can have weights and all that, but it's gonna do it real time. Okay. After that, we have, make it a little bigger, you have the baseline and canary information. So think of baseline and canary as the scopes. These are the ways you're scoping those templated queries. In most cases, it's a server group, an ASG or a MIG or a, you know, a Kubernetes replica set, something like that. Something that's grouping a bunch of things uh, over which you're aggregating the metrics you care about. And then location, so in most cases, especially here, that'll be region, but it depends on your use case. For Kubernetes, it could be namespace, could be something you came up with. These things are just used to build queries, and the, the, the operators configuring this can, can use these, these attributes anyway. <laughs> Step size, um, just about every system, not Datadog, but all the others allow for when you're querying for time series data, you can say, you know, what step size to use, what. Um, intervals used between the data points that are in time. And we said it's retrospective, say so you have start time, end time, um, resource type, we use this for Stackdriver and for Prometheus, we can use it within the queries. Um, Atlas doesn't have something like this, but again, these things are used to build up the queries, and we'll look at how the queries are composed in a second. There's a way to provide extra variable bindings for your queries. You can have custom templates and things, and this lets you use the Spinnaker uh, expression capability spell to refer to values in your pipeline context and pass those down to them. And the last thing is that we mentioned the thresholds. These are pre-populated by default from that canary config, but you can tune them for your, your uh, given application. So as quickly as we run this, let's talk about what this is doing. So um, we're referring to data that was collected in the past. It's not real time. We gave it the time boundaries. I referred, I think, to well, hopefully to two separate server groups. Yep. yep, so the first one is the baseline, the second one is a canary, and it's gonna start running, and I think I gave it an interval of 15 minutes. Um, there's a, a setting there where you can choose what type of window to use for the, um, the data that's considered in each analysis, and we did growing. So it'll be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour. See that reflected here, and we put in some things that came in handy for us when we were developing it, um, where you can like implicitly copy to your clipboard the different time settings and the timestamps and these kinds of things. But it looks kind of consistent, the result. So remember, this is not, it's not a meaningful set of metrics we're looking at. But that 77 came from someplace pretty interesting. I'll show you in a second. When you look at the weights all the way at the bottom, so I said, wait, the network group 77 and then there were smaller numbers. And I did this because it's the only one that's passing because the other ones are, are way off. Um, but let's look at the, the results now. So we ran that pipeline, it ran the one stage, um, it succeeded, and then we have four links here. And each of these links takes you to a report. And if we click on a report, this is really, the, I think, the most interesting view system. So um, it has the overall <clears throat> resulting score for this run. It's just for that one interval. It's not for all of them. And then it has each of the metrics we considered. For each one, you can get the graph. You can drill down. There are different types of graph views. It's pretty full featured. Um, a little smaller. And there's some simple statistical information provided at the bottom. It'll tell you about as much details it has about the classification that was applied uh, to each metric. And then for each group, you can you can drill down to the individual groups or look at them all together. Um, the nice thing is backing this is a report, <coughs> excuse me, as Michael described, we persist all the intermediate objects. The end as the analysis uh, works its way along and you can drill down to that information, which especially as you start using the system turns out to be pretty helpful. So everything here is resolvable with URL and have deep links to all the data. And in this case, it's really just showing all of the information that was provided to Kienta to run the canary analysis. And then it shows the results that came back from the judge. It references the config, has basically everything it needs to repeat that, that exact run, including what the results were. Okay. One other very interesting thing that's linked from the report is the actual set of metrics that were returned. So think about it, we have a control and an experiment or a, a baseline and a canary, and for each we get a set of time series returned, and then we have to align those things. So we'll look at the top in a second, but you pretty quickly can see the, the data that was retrieved. So this is the set of control data points, that's the experiment data points. This is just for one of the metrics, it's for CPU, load, 
which I think is, is this one's a stack driver metric. And at the top, it does encode the full query that resulted from expanding the template that we defined earlier. So in this case, it's, you know, it refers to the metric by name, the type of instance, there's some stuff to scope into a project, the region, and then the labels are used to actually find the server group we care about. So really the only difference we should see is, in this case, is the name of the server group. Okay. And then we should see the same chunk that we saw there for each of the other metrics. So instead of CPU load, we have memory usage. Same thing, so step size, starting point, and all the data, and so on. So there are three of them. Is that all making sense so far? Too fast, too slow? Question. Not too small? Yep. So is there a, a assumption or dependency that uh, the server group has to be homogeneous or uniform? For example, uh, a service can be deployed to a cluster um, that has certain VM that run database yeah. backend and certain VM run machine learning analytics. Yep. And would this technology be able to distinguish? Yes, yeah, so there's, I think, I can think of at least two answers to that. And I see Michael moves. There's probably three or more answers, but I'll start with the first <laughs> easy one, which is so if you're talking about a server group, typically those are homogenous things, even if you're out with versions. But I think that's only really relevant if you're looking at like infrastructure type metrics, so CPU and memory things. Even with um, infrastructure, right? Different server will have different configurations. Yeah, absolutely. Certain node has more memory, certain node has yep. more storage. Yeah. Right? Yes. So often, I would say most often, you'd probably want to try to look at application level metrics. So something that your application published that didn't come implicitly from the infrastructure. So lots of folks, especially on <laughs> Kubernetes, you'll see this a lot, will have labels that they assign that identify their service, maybe the version of the service. And those would, those are the set of things that you would want to run these types of queries over. <coughs> I'll take, my, I'll take my take on this. Um, so you're specifically looking for things that are different. So if you set up your experiment in such a way that things are going to be different from the beginning, you're not going to get good results from Canary. Um, we expect a server group to be homogeneous in both the server type, the, the type of instance it's running on, the resources it has available, and the uh, behavior in that any of them will answer any query. So if you end up with node A in a group that answers all types of query for a given query and type node B does something different, you're going to get differences. So that would not be a use case for Canary the way it's written right now. That answer the question? Yes. Yeah. There's some limitations, right? But yeah. medically, right, those uh, service now deployed into the cloud. And even though you specify certain configuration to AWS, what exactly is the VM? What exactly is the configuration that you get? It's not really that controllable. Well, we find so, it to be very controllable, actually. I mean, if you specify, and I'm not using the mic, but <laughs> uh, if, I found that if you specify an, an M4 instance of you know M4XL, you get something that's very consistent between a different M4XL. You might get one that's bad. In, AWS does deploy bad instances, in which case your canary will fail. And it will be looking at the report, you'll kind of figure out what's going on. But overall, it's, this isn't intended to say inside of a server group that the application, the individual nodes intentionally behave differently. In that case, there's no way we can actually, we would see differences and your canary would fail. Or you'd have to set the threshold so wide that when we did actually do the analysis, it would be a meaningless analysis. Uh, in a way, this uh, uh, technology can be extended so that the configuration can include different services in the same server, the server group. Right, but like I said, we, right now the way it's designed, we don't expect that to happen. So we, 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 yeah, we expect everything inside the server group the way it's designed today. I'm not saying we couldn't do it. We can talk up after this maybe. But I don't think that that use case is something that we would uh, support right now, mainly because we expect a server group to service a particular API or, or service, that everything in that server group is equally likely to get serviced for, to answer the queries. I, w I would group by the instance type. Like if you are, yeah. you know, whatever it is you request is one thing, but as long as you can suss out what machine you, you ended up on, I would aggregate, including that as a grouping mechanism, and then you will get data that's aggregated by instance type. And you can just make certain your baseline and canary both are on the same server type. Because we're not comparing it to the cluster necessarily, we're just comparing it to the two instances or three instances that's been out. Right. Cool. All right. So let's show one other thing. Um, 
Um, so we looked at a pretty straightforward stack driver sample. I'll do the same thing with Prometheus. Um, so I'm not going to cover the whole UI again. It's roughly the same thing. Uh, uh, create a new configuration. So if we were going to create a new Prometheus configuration, give it a name. So I choose Prometheus. And it's, this list is populated based on whatever metric stores we have. So I chose Prometheus. Not going to go all the way through it. But the most important thing is when I go to configure a given metric, what it's populating the list with has to do with Prometheus, not with Stackdriver. It's coming from the backing system. Right. So I did this obviously in advance. So I created another very production ready pipeline with one canary analysis stage. And this time, instead of referring to the Stackdriver config, we refer to the Prometheus config. We're still in this case looking at GC uh, server groups. One interesting thing you'll note here is I'm comparing something to itself. And as far as Cayenta is concerned, it really, it doesn't care. We're going to give it pairs of things to compare. It can be the same thing. It can be the same thing with different timing information. So you can compare how something looked now versus earlier and so on. So same thing with baseline information, canary information. We give it the names of the server groups. We give it the region in this case, step size, time boundaries. So no other differences there. So we'll run that. I would expect a good result since we're comparing something to itself. All right. um, and we did, I think, 15 minutes with five minute duration so, or uh, intervals. So you end up with three five minute runs. And we click on graph. Histogram probably isn't the best view for that kind of data. But if you look at this chart and if we disable baseline, I don't know if you can actually see the color difference. But they're one on top of the other. It's collecting the same data from each. But the most important thing is you see just the one metric that's configured. It's just within one group. And if you look at the data that's behind this, um, you can see the query that was built. And this looks nothing like the other one. This is a uh, Prometheus query. So it's averaging the results of querying, filtering on node CPU. We're choosing the CPU modes. Um, we use a regex for the instance name here, since there's no notion of a server group as far as Prometheus is concerned. We filter on zone as well. And this, in this case, is all using the like default um, service discovery configuration for Prometheus. There's nothing we did to Prometheus to make this work. Um, and then the end results, you can see the data, and they should match exactly, because it just queried the same thing twice. And there's a bunch of other stuff you'd expect. You know, there are views where you can find all the reports and, and so on. And we did a few extra sort of nice things on top right out of the box, like you can configure, um, you can configure to show you just the configs for your application or the configs for all applications. And in this case, we have it configured to show uh, canary configs from other applications. It shows who the owner is, but it won't let you edit it. So you can use them, but you can't make changes to them. And this is configurable per um, Spinnaker installation. So somebody can set it up and say, we want each team to have their own. And that's supported again all the way up through through Halyard. Any questions so far or? Yes. Prometheus specific integration. I see the names. I'd like to hear more. Yeah. So um, for Kubernetes, we did quite a bit of testing with Prometheus. Um, it doesn't, the difference with Prometheus and Kubernetes in particular is it doesn't make really any base assumptions about how you're configured. So with Stackdriver, with Atlas, with other systems, um, if you're querying GCE or AWS, there's a lot we implicitly know. We know we're going to have a region or a zone available. We know you'll have, uh, in the Amazon case, you'll have a, a tag that'll have the name of the ASG and that kind of thing. With Prometheus, we don't assume any of that. So the testing we did was with the service discovery for Kubernetes, um, node exporter, and a couple of other integrations. Um, and we made sure that we could create full-on custom queries in the UI against Kubernetes. Um, it's mostly up to the deployers on those platforms to decide what their label setup is. So we just had to make sure that we support the full configuration. And then when you configure the canary stages to use those configs, that you can provide that information. And that's that's where the, um, in the stage UI, sorry, I'll find it. In the stage configuration, you have this extended params, and then you can put um, Spinnaker style uh, expressions here, and those get propagated all the way to that Prometheus. Did that answer the question? You only look half convinced. No. Uh, yeah. my, my next question is sure. are you using this in house? All right. Great <laughs> question. So I will be as uh, transparent as I can. Um, 
So we work a lot with Waze. Um, they're, I would describe it as evaluating it in production. So they're, they're not, it's not an experiment off to the side. They've stated publicly they're going to adopt this. They had a very cool system they built in house just for their use, which relied on some scripts and other things and a discovery layer, some things they wanted to away from. So they've been working on adopting this, but I would describe their use currently as evaluating it. Um, I can say a little more. Um, we have obviously other canary systems inside of Google. A lot of this stuff has been written publicly about. Um, the team that works on those systems is working on integrating support for, or adding support for their judge into the system as well. And uh, we've gotten as far as sort of making sure it can meet, but we haven't connected the railroads yet. But that's happening pretty much now. And that's that's an experiment though. Is that an question? All right. Um, any other questions? Yes. Um, is, uh, is this available for any of the evaluation installations other than Halyard? You know, like uh, Home Chart for Kubernetes or the AWS eval install, the quick start? All right. Let me question. go in order. So you said Helm Chart? Yeah. All right. So the Helm Chart, um, what we're trying to do with the Helm Chart, so that was done by one of the solutions architects, Google Vic. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to like keep that current without having to like ping Vic and keep asking him to work on it. Uh, yeah, so what we're thinking is that we'll be able to update that to have that use Halyard. Okay. That's that's the, the short story. It's probably all I understand about it as well. But the idea is that if it then used Halyard, we'd be able to add canary support to it as an example without having to go and rework that whole chart. But right now it does not support it yet. The Kubernetes setup. So there's a, a one line like kube, kube control apply that will get you a full setup, which is sort of like a try it out type of setup. It it's, works, but you wouldn't want to rely on it and scale it out for production. Um, we are, at the end of this week and early into next week, going to be adding support for this into that system. We're not sure yet whether we'll be able to also install Prometheus as part of that. We would like to. We had more difficulties than we would have expected getting the service discovery for Kubernetes to work with Prometheus and Node Exporter out of the box. For whatever reason, it was, it was harder than we expected. Um, but we're going to be working on that shortly. Right now, the only like out of the box solution to get support for this is via Halyard and the Atomic Spinnaker version <coughs> releases. Got it. That that answer the question? Yes. Yes. Um, something related to the Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, we uh, they provide the uh, Henry kind of Henry support using the rolling updates and rollback, where I define 25 percent of my new version could be running on this. And if I use Spinnaker on the back end of uh, Kubernetes, and Spinnaker also provides Canary deployment, how does, who is responsible for what? For example, if I configure something totally different, like run 50% of my version 1 using the Spinnaker, whereas on uh, Kubernetes, I mentioned only 25%. So somebody, one is going to overwrite other configuration, or uh, how is it? Potentially, yeah. So I think the question is really how do you coordinate um, some of the like canary and deployment capabilities that are sort of offered out of the box with Kubernetes with what Spinnaker is doing on top of Kubernetes. Um, so there's a new Kubernetes provider in Spinnaker, which we call the Kubernetes V2 provider, which is what we call like manifest oriented. So instead of doing things in a declarative way where it's um, executing commands one at a time on your behalf and waiting for things to complete, um, it, it takes manifest updates them with changes like I saw a new image or a new manifest is available or whatever um, and then rolls those out with group control so you can I'm answering a question kind of in two parts but you can orchestrate those kinds of deployments with Spinnaker without a lot of fuss in terms of how to coordinate the canary pick capabilities this is something we have to figure out I really don't have a short answer um, if you go and have a deployment or something else modifying the way traffic is handled on Kubernetes, and then you do something at the same time with Spinnaker, those things are going to interfere with one another, whether it has to do with canarying or not. Um, but I think we can probably come up with some guidance on how to, to coordinate those things. But that's like something we're trying to figure out. Sorry, I wish I had a, a better answer on it right now. Any other questions? Oh, all right. Um, Almost done. Are we over time? Yeah. All right, sorry. Almost done. Almost done. Okay. 
so we talked a little bit about uh, retrospective canary pipelines, but we would like to be able to say if you ran a real time canary analysis, be able to say from this generate a retrospective canary analysis pipeline so I can just run this later. I can keep going for now, but capture the, all the parameters and the boundaries and everything for later. Being able to do something like that ad hoc, we think would be pretty useful as well. So not having to go within the pipeline and provide all those parameters, but maybe provide it like we do other ad hoc operations. And you know, all these like potential advanced use cases are kind of emerging now that, that it's quite stable and it's out there. Um, if you have a canary and you've as a human chosen some period of time and it worked the way you wanted, Maybe you want to make that thing quicker or you want to optimize it. So can you have the canary system um, like automate that, help you a little bit? Uh, if you say, well, I, you know, how good can I get at 30 minutes instead of two hours? We're hoping we can make it smarter at answering those kinds of questions. Um, and another thing that came up was, well, as a human, maybe I don't have canary analysis integrated in my, my release pipelines yet, but I know that this particular pipeline went bad and I am collecting metrics. I have full instrumentation here. Well, based on this time segment where I know things went bad, what can you tell me about what kind of canary may have been helpful in, in observing that behavior and, and uh, making that safer? And I think uh, the first two sentences are probably mine. Yeah, so right now that one stage we showed just does the analysis, it just coordinates Kent, it doesn't provision the baseline and canary server groups that Michael described, it doesn't do any cleanup later, it just does the analysis. Um, we're working on building that out to have full capabilities to do the provisioning and the cleanup and all of that. And lastly, the extension points that we mentioned, you have to work on the code base directly to plug those additional capabilities in. We want to make it so you can have a, a better uh, plug-in mechanism without having to upstream all change. And two of the things I've been working on very shortly here is a, a way to uh, get more of a practical result. Because in some cases, our algorithm is very, we're very good at detecting differences, but sometimes you might not care. And how much you care, or some mechanism which you're not really certain exactly what it's going to look like, we can we can be like, yeah, well, one percent difference is okay, two percent difference, something like that. Right now, we are very sensitive to having a small amount of difference if it's consistent. Like the canary is always one percent higher than the baseline, that will be flagged as a difference. If they alternate back and forth, that's okay. That's what we expect to see. Uh, the other one is the importance of metrics. Um, a lot of the feedback we get from our users here at Netflix is, if that metric right there fails, I want the canary to stop. And I don't care what else where I have, that's a fail. And sometimes I want this included in the report, but I really don't want it to include to, to matter in the actual score. Um, it's more of a, if my canary fails, I also want to see this other metric so I can help diagnose, diagnose the problem right away. And we use it here. We are using it in production at Netflix. We are not fully deployed. We have the legacy system that a lot of people are still using, and we're rolling people over. We're about 35, 30%, something like that, rolled over into the new system. And you can't create a configuration in the old system any longer. You have to use Penguins now for, for future canary work. And we're working with teams individually to roll theirs over um, people like to know that they're going to get consistent results and that they're not going to get something unexpected when they're trying to just deploy something, especially if it's in, in a uh, rough situation. Uh, we are using older pipelines. We have had done Canary here for a very long time, and there's this magic translation layer in between that kind of fakes it, which we are absolutely not going to open source. We're going to burn to the ground as soon as we possibly can. Um, it has a lot of, Rob is we would love that. Um, but by the end of quarter two, we hope to not have any legacy system remaining and be entirely uh, using, using uh, Spinnaker and Kayenta for all of our deployments that are canary based. And we do have a slide that has links. And if you take a picture, I think you can click on them. But uh, <laughs> we'll release the PDF of this so you, you'll have these clickable links. Because otherwise, blog and you know, kind of webinar are not so good. We are open source on GitHub. We have the, the first link here is actually the link to the Kayanta source code, which is the server behind it. The second one is to all the UI stuff. If you want to add things, those are the two repos you need to be most concerned about. Uh, we are doing a webinar together in two weeks. Uh, so that's something to sign up for. And once again, the link is here. It's also the links are also in our in our blog. So if you search for the Google blog or the Netflix blog, there are links across the board. The big thing we're trying to do now is to make this stuff more consumable, like work on education, best practices, code labs, and things, because it's a big pile of stuff to absorb. So we're trying to figure out how to make it easier. To make it so that's what we're up to. And you can read about the blog post as well. So it's released. Are there any questions? 
Chris. So Chris here is he's the brains behind the algorithm. So he's asking a question which is terrifying. <laughs> I'll give you an easy one. Is it Kayenta or Kayenta? Kayenta. I looked this up. I actually called, there's a town in Utah called Kayenta. Or sorry, Arizona. Actually, there's one in Utah as well that nobody talks about that apparently. In Arizona, called Kayenta. I actually called the mayor and apologized for taking over the, the top three searches for the last week at Google. Yeah, I did. I called him up and said, hi, how you doing? Yeah, the, well, the mayor's office, and they put me through because he had apparently heard about this, and he's like, "What? What? Why did they name it after us?" And it's like, "Well, technically, I named it after the geological well, formation." Named it Tarmigan like we wanted. Nobody <laughs> would complain. <laughs> so yeah, that was interesting. But I asked him how to how to pronounce it specifically because I knew that we had a little difference of opinion, and I think it's the accent more than anything. It is Kayenta. Kayenta. <laughs> Kalienta, yeah. Kalienta? <laughs> Another question in the back there? Yeah, um, I had a question. I, I wanted to know if you guys had any examples or stories where um, ACA or Cayenta saved the day, or you know, kind of found something that was memorable that you could share with us. Well, I can tell you two stories that I know of. Um, I mean, honestly, most of the time when it saves the day, I don't hear about it because the deployment was canceled early enough. Uh, Chris might have some better stories here too, so I may just put him on the spot and hand the microphone over. But I can tell you when uh, Canary would have helped in some cases, and people haven't done Canary, or they manually bypassed it. Uh, one instance that we had here which caused a problem was uh, we, we do something here where we, it's a, a Kong exercise, where we literally, de we, we evacuate an entire region. In this case, they were running the Canary deployment during that time, and that region failed, which is kind of expected. And they went ahead and promoted anyway. And it turns out that it was actually detecting a problem in that region that had they ignored that Kong exercise and expected it to fail, it would have actually caught a problem. And we get a lot of cases where people will, um, from watching one of our channels here, it, the common thing is if there's if there's a problem in an application and there's a canary running, roll back. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the canaries are causing the failure. It just means that they go back to a known state as quickly as possible. So they cancel anything that's a difference. Uh, we do get a lot of canaries that fail. We actually have a chat channel and we watch all the canary scores go by and we see a fair number of them that are failures. One of the feedback mechanisms that we're trying to get into this is this was actually a good judgment. We don't actually have any user feedback, so we don't actually get a lot of that information. We, if there's instant report, one of the things that's asked is, did you do a canary and what was the result? So I don't have any really good success stories for the, the ones where it caught problems. I only have the, the horror stories for where it didn't, and it's almost always a, a metric was not chosen well, or the time blank wasn't there, or they skipped the region manually. That goes to my second question, actually. Um, so you mentioned chaos, monkey chaos, Kong. Um, is there any um, integration between the two when you activate both in Spinnaker? Well, Canary know to turn that off or not have instances get destroyed while you're running. Yeah, Chaos Monkey is told don't don't touch Canary instances. <laughs> Otherwise, it would go out in the middle. So it's told to deliberately ignore those. Uh, for kit for Kong exercises, um, it's harder. There's no integration right now, and we're a little leery to put that in. And we kind of want that. That's kind of a manual judgment thing. I think at that point, if you're deploying in that situation, you kind of have to know what you're doing. Right. So there's no integration in that. We've been asked by users to be able to give some sort of feedback. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, with regards to deploying to Kubernetes or and, and the, the canary analysis there, um, you mentioned that there, there still needs to be another stage to vision and analysis and cleanup. But would this be, would you be using an additional deployment or two? To do the for the baseline and and canary. Yeah. So right now the way the stage works, the way it looks, it just does the analysis, and we're going to think of that as kind of the nucleus of the stage, and then we're going to build out from there. And there'll be optional provisioning capabilities, and this is something we've been talking about. That if you look at the way it looks in the, the deployment steps to deploy to AWS versus Kubernetes, they look quite different and getting more different over time. So it'd be hard to just add all of those controls directly. And so I'm trying to see if there's some way to actually say, well, this synthesizes these types of deployment stages, and then you would refer to them. So 
as far as the analysis is concerned, it doesn't matter whether you configured it in that stage or not. But I'm hoping the end result is one stage with optional provisioning capabilities for all the platforms where the provisioning capabilities look exactly like they do, even if you're not doing a canary analysis, that it's the same deployment. So that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there's one thing I want to add to what Michael said. I know we're way over time. <laughs> Bum rush us. The, uh, in terms of knowing if a canary was good or not, one thing that this setup now where we have a nice integration with Spinnaker uh, enables is that you can really start to gather data about whether something was a good or a bad canary. So if you're interested in false positives or, or false negatives, and the control plate is Spinnaker, you will have that information. Not just was a canary run, what was the end result, did a human override it, did they eventually roll and we can start to look at that sort of higher level of information to try to improve the canary process over time. That's it. Thanks. So next, uh, we'll have a session how to enable uh, Kubernetes to deploy into OpenShift. Who is using OpenShift or looking at OpenShift as a as a means of, uh, okay, there's two people in the back that's using um, OpenShift. Maybe you can take a break and have some pizza. Can you guys hear me? Uh, there was a great presentation from Matt and Mike. Uh, so I'll make this quick so we can go finish our time. <laughs> so I'm Gopinath Rebala, and with OpsMX, uh, we provide services for Spinnaker, both for installation and ongoing support. Uh, we also have a Canary judge who is integrated with Spinnaker as well as we support other environment systems. Um, today, we will talk a little bit about Spinnaker on OpenShift. So OpenShift is a platform that's based on Kubernetes. It's completely open source. It's a representative of a bunch of Kubernetes systems that we see nowadays, either Mesos or, or, or AWS, Kubernetes. They all have similar characteristics. Now, we go through the brief description of what OpenShift architecture is and what are the issues that you would face when you're trying to use Spinnaker with um, OpenShift. There are some nomenclature differences as well as some security issues that you don't see if you're going with the base Kubernetes. We'll look at that and quickly show you how that's used. So OpenShift is, uh, can be deployed on AWS or bare metal or GCP or Azure. It, it has a standard configuration. It has a built-in networking, security, so that those are the infrastructure nodes. 
and you can have the masters on multiple availability zones for high availability uh, and application nodes that can be distributed across multiple availability zones. Fairly standard uh, way of doing things. And it also has the uh, completely supports native Kubernetes. Uh, they created one layer on top of Kubernetes, Kube Control controls. It essentially integrates the user login, other security information, annotations that go with the pods. Uh, it supports fully multi tenant, essentially provides the annotations so the tenants don't see each other namespaces and et cetera. Uh, the default plugin they use for is OpenVSwitch. They come from the OpenStack environment where they have all the storage and networking. They brought in most of that into this. Networking doesn't fit in entirely. So, sorry, networking fits in entirely, but the storage doesn't fit in as cleanly. So they have additional changes that are done for that. Um, so if you look at what the differences between native Kubernetes and OpenShift, it uses most of the services provided by Kubernetes, um, except there are a few things with the that come in the box, like the SDN. So Kubernetes supports plugins for networking, uh, plugin for storage. Uh, OpenShift comes with the default plugins for both of them. Uh, SDN is the open with switch. Uh, and they have the original features where you can go from source to deployment. Uh, they have integrations with GitHub, Jenkins. Uh, they have a built-in registry. So that's pretty much it. But enterprises that we found, uh, they like to use Spinnaker. I don't have to tell this group here. But the Spinnaker gives safe deployment strategies, multiple deployment strategies. It provides seamless rollbacks. And now we saw this automated verification with Kayanta. And provides a bunch of stages where you can easily integrate with the tools for compliance. It's completely open source, which is also a big deal for most of the uh, companies. And it supports multi-cloud deployments. So going with that, uh, one of the key differences in nomenclature all because of the security with OpenShift is the difference between the namespace that Spinnaker deploys to versus the project uh, used by OpenShift. Project is essentially a wrapper around namespace with annotations. Uh, it, every incoming call goes through the security check um, that's a, a wrapper to a namespace and then allows the project to go to the namespace. So you know Kubernetes does not support users standard. Right? It only has the service accounts and um, system accounts. So, what uh, OpenShift does is for enterprises, it integrates with authentication systems and supports out of the box users. You can have plugins for Kubernetes. So essentially, this one is providing the authentication plugin for Kubernetes. This is one of the things that makes the difference. Uh, now, most of the installations, as we heard earlier, the Helm charts exist, but they are not being supported. Uh, Halyard is the one that is going to be more de facto installation system for Kubernetes. But there are some issues with Halyard, essentially. When it deploys, it assumes certain security permission. It uses root for file copying into the pods and stuff like that. So th those are the ones that we have to work around for systems like OpenShift when we deploy. Um, but we can deploy using Spinnaker, using Halyard into OpenShift uh, by using distributed deployment strategy. And also it supports uh, red black deployment into the OpenShift. So the simplest thing that we need to do is because Halyard is using the root files to deploy into the pods, well, we have to specify additional permissions for that Spinnaker um, security account, service account. So the OC is a command that's wrapped around kube control that allows you to administer the security permissions. SCC is a, a security control policy for OpenShift. So simply specify that and specify the route. Route is, again, equivalent to ingress, um, but they have these additional features to make it very easy using a proxy to send it up. 
uh, and give it the, the URL for exposing to the outside world. It's very easy to make it into HTTPS also. Uh, the HA proxy, you can terminate SSL there, or you can terminate the cell into the pods themselves. Um, and in DEC, it does something different. Um, when, when you deploy with the handler, it actually copies some files in some places. So you, you give additional permissions to that. And create a service account. This uh, permissions are required uh, as a cluster permissions uh, given to the service account when we are deploying. Um, this is typically uses query to get all the namespaces um, to identify what namespaces exist, what secrets exist. So we give those kind of permissions and deploy. Right. Uh, this is the typical configuration where you would have a Redis and video as a storage systems, like a messaging system and storage system. Um, that are out. You don't want Halia to deploy Redis for you. Right? Because that uh, requires additional permissions and the management is not good. You don't have the high availability that comes with the HAL node. So you want to use that Redis outside. And you can deploy the rest of the services using HAL node. Let's say the authentication, authorization and authentication system is LDAP. Um, you can use that integration that comes with Spinnaker. Uh, and and um, the OpenShift supports a bunch of authentication systems. By default, it comes with Active Directory LDAP integrations. We can use the same thing. Uh, and you're ready to run Spinnaker in OpenShift now. Now, how do you use Spinnaker to deploy applications in OpenShift with multi-tenant support? So one of the problems we have is once you set up a service account in Spinnaker, for all the deployments, it uses the same service account. There is no impersonation that's being done by the Halyard. So you have to bring in authorization through the author authorization groups, either from LDAP or OAuth, or one of the systems that you integrate with. You, the way you would want to do it is create accounts in Spinnaker. And with those accounts, you specify namespaces that you don't want to restrict the permissions to, and have the user groups in LDAP or OAuth um, that give permissions to those groups. Once you have all that set up, uh, the, as the user logs into the Spinnaker you want, they will only see those namespaces or those groups. So they only have access to deploy to those namespace groups, and they will only see pods or applications deployed in those namespaces. Um, that's it. Hey, actually, uh, so this is a. They want to show something. So this is how the console for OpenShift looks like. You can see the Spinnaker pods running in the OpenShift. Uh, there is a route set up for the deck. You can have any questions? Any questions? Okay, so um, I think uh, we will be here after this um, for a few minutes. If you have any questions, you can stop by. Thank you for attending. So hopefully uh, you'll see Andy send out uh, the Spinnaker Summit uh, announcement at some point. Perfect. It'll go out next week, I think. And uh, we'll do another meetup soon. Thank you very much. If you're interested in uh, speaking in one of those uh, events, please uh, come and see me so that when we do the next one, we can be the Thank you.
remember I joked about it. Yeah. I decided to do it last night. So, uh, uh, that's it. Yeah. I thought I'd just get a few scores. Yeah. 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 Yeah.